As I'm sure you're aware, businesses continue to face challenges when it comes to attracting and retaining talent. Recruiting, filling, and retaining employees has drastically changed over time and has now shifted to what I call the employee market, meaning that there's more jobs than employees. This forces employers to think outside of the box to attract these talent, uh, talent pipelines. Untraditional talent pipelines such as stay-at-home parents, older workforce, and returning retirees. This morning we have several experts that have worked with both businesses and job seekers to bridge this gap and encourage leaders to think differently when attracting talent. I would like to introduce Jim Morgan, President and Business Development Workforce Strategies with MRA. Jim brings his years of experience by providing support to business leaders through talent attraction efforts, marketing, and public speaking. As one of the largest employer associations in the nation, MRA helps its members' organizations through offering most of the comprehensive assortment of HR services, talent management, learning, and organization development opportunities. Please welcome Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Cassandra. Uh, I'm gonna, my job in this is really to make everybody after me whatever they're gonna to present to you look really, really important. So my job is to depress you a little bit and explain to you just how bad this problem is right now, and then they're gonna give you all the solutions to it. So when we started talking about this about a year and a half ago, um, we named it the Sandsdemic, and good Catholic boy had to learn Latin when I was an altar boy and things like that. But from Latin, this is just means without people. And that's really where we're at right now, and I'm not sure that people have quite figured that out. So what I'm gonna do is share with you what we've learned from our 3,000 em, uh, employers, and really what MRA is is this, and my Reader's uh, Digest condensed version is, if you need HR help, if you need training, if you need people, or if you need comp data, you can come see us. That's not the advertisement. The advertisement is, is what it's nice is to be able to share with you what companies throughout the upper Midwest are doing some of their best practices and, and what, they're, what they're facing. So here's what's happening right now, and this is the part that I'm not sure people have figured out yet. If you've been in this business long enough, you know that there's been times when you haven't been able to find people, but usually it's been a mismatch between what you need and what was being produced. And so I would say at that time it was an economic problem. We just weren't quite putting together the right talent supply chain. Now I'd argue to you that it's demographic. This is just a numbers game, and I'm not sure everybody has figured that out, but it's a numbers game, and it's a numbers game that's not going to get better. So when we were putting this together, um, my seven-year-old grandson was in town from Los Angeles. He said, well, Grandpa, what are you doing? I said, well, I have to do a presentation. And I said, on oh, what? And I said, well, here in Wisconsin, we've got a little bit of a problem that we're not really having very many babies. We don't have a lot of people that are moving in here. We've got a lot of people that are going somewhere else. We're getting older. And as any seven-year-old boy would say, oh, you're like the dinosaurs, because everything is about dinosaurs. So you're going extinct. And I said, well, I'm not sure we're quite there yet, but we might be headed that direction. So this is what's happening out there. And if you're reading any of the headlines, these are the things that you're seeing right now. And you have to, at some point, step back and say, my gosh, something's going on out there. Something's happening. How in the world can we be doing things like this, where we're paying an $8,000 signing bonus if you start in August and stay until December? No one had ever heard of something like that. People that are doing training now, and if it's virtual, one of the benefits that they offer to their employees is you can take it anywhere, meaning you can go anywhere in the continental United States for the next two weeks and do your virtual training. We'll pay for it. That's not a bad gig. I'd like to do virtual training looking out over the mountains or looking out over the ocean. So all of this is happening right now, and people are trying to figure out why has this gotten so difficult, and quite frankly, an awful lot of people who look an awful lot like me are screaming at their HR departments and their hiring managers saying, what in the world are you doing? Why can't you go out and find me some people? So you're seeing companies do all of these types of things. How do we get people? How do we differentiate ourselves in the market? How do we make ourselves look a little bit different? And again, a lot of people who look an awful lot like me are saying, I never got subscriptions to thing. Nobody ever came and cleaned my house. 
Nobody ever got me massages and spa treatments. You're right, they didn't. Because when I was applying for a job, there were like 200 of us applying for one job, and now we've got one person applying, and we've got 200 openings. So the game has dramatically changed, and we cannot like it, but it's the reality. And so if this is what people are doing, then this is what we have to do to compete. And then when you go into your HR department, this is basically a Monday in HR, trying to figure out, okay, what are we going to do today? And now we've put on top of that all of the needs that we've got in terms of trying to go find people. And they're sort of pushing back now saying, you know what? I'm not finding you any more people until you do your part. And so hiring managers are getting some of that back. So here's what's happening. This is the depressing part, so I'll just forewarn you. This is basically the working age population predicted out through 2090. Now, people smarter than me can figure out how to predict this out to 2090. I'm smart enough to know that people aren't having four or five kids. They're not having them by the time they're 25 years old, and they're more likely to have two dogs than two children. So that alone probably explains half of it. But every one of these is a projection that says this is going to get more difficult. And so now we're looking at it and saying, all right, well, we peaked in about 2008, 2010, and every percentage drop is about another 2 million people that we don't have available to us in the United States. So that sort of sets the groundwork for what's happening out there. And yet people are celebrating, hey, this is great. We've got full employment. We're under 3%. Isn't this a wonderful thing? It is, unless you're trying to find people. Then it gets a little bit more difficult. And so this is what we're facing right now in that when you get to 3% unemployment, you basically have full employment. You are now looking at people that you have never had to look at before, and with that comes all kinds of increased difficulty and increased investment. And that's not even the bad news yet. Here's the bad news. You're going to see a path here in the Northeast and the Midwest where that's really where we've got the biggest problems. So you look at the decline of the young people under the age of uh, 25, that's who we're looking for, that's a problem for us. You look at diversity, each one of those states has a year in it, that's the year that that state matched the United States ethnicity, meaning Wisconsin looks like the United States did in 1974. Why does that matter? If I'm a person of color and I'm trying to figure out where it is I want to move, where I want to go, I'm not sure 1974 is where I want to go to. I sure as heck don't want to go to 1930. So that's an issue for us, and we've got to make sure that we're conscious of that as we're trying to recruit people. We're not a big international attraction site. People in Germany and China and, and um, Taiwan are not thinking of coming to Wisconsin. We're not a domestic place for people to go. We're not the spot that the kids in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia are saying, hey, I'd like to go to Wisconsin. Half of them probably can't even find Wisconsin. We don't really have that hub. We have Milwaukee to a certain extent, but there's one thing that we know about 25-year-olds is they want to go where all the other 25-year-olds are, are going. And that's why you see Austin and Portland and Seattle and the Carolinas. That's where folks want to go if they're younger because that's where everybody else is going. And then we're getting old really fast. And we're holding on to our old people really well, but it's everybody else that we're having a little bit of trouble with. And so if you look at the numbers for Wisconsin, I'll share in just a minute, um, that makes things even more difficult. And then this is where it gets a little personal, but we need every female to have 2.1 children just to break even. And we haven't broken even in the United States in 49 of the last 50 years. So that'll give you some idea of where we're at right now. And then you look at, I know what you're thinking, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, the overachievers, what are they doing? There's nothing else to do in those states, so that's why they're doing so well. <laughs> so here are the numbers for Wisconsin. And this was put out by the Applied Population Lab in 2010. They've updated them. They've actually gotten a little bit worse. Sorry. But when you look at the growth of where things are going to be, you look at the fact that we're only going to increase that working age population by 15,000 at a time when we've got 100,000 openings, that's when you begin to see your problem. So 95% of our growth is over the age of 65. Think about that for a minute. 
and what that means for education, for health care, for nursing homes, for roads, for homes. That's a big deal, and nobody's really paying much attention to it. And then this is what's happening right now. The baby boomers are starting to go. We're 10,000 of us turning 65 every day. A bunch of people got out because of all the technology and virtual and said, I'm out, I don't want to deal with this. People are going to a gig economy. So all kinds of things are happening out there. We're dropping off. The millennials are coming flying up. The poor Gen Xers in the room. Any of you? You were in charge there for whoop, about 18 months, and you did a hell of a job. That's it. You're done now. And then you've got the group after that who is now being signified by the goldfish um, for the Gen Zers. The, gen, the, the goldfish being, if you've ever had a goldfish in your life and you tap on the side of the bowl, you can hold their attention for about seven seconds. That's going to matter to us because I don't want to take a cut at them. Every generation thinks the one after them is the one that's going to destroy the world. I am the baby boomer, ponytailed, long-haired, anti-war, never going to amount to anything generation, and now we own everything, so, huh. <laughs> so now they're coming through. So why does all of that matter? So here's sort of the, okay, now there's the bad news, now what do we do about it? So you're trying to find candidates right now, especially if you're trying to find candidates under the age of 35. It's got to be fast. It's got to be easy. It's got to be online. I've got to be able to do it on my phone. It can't take longer than two weeks. If you're going to get me in there, you better get me in there quick, and you may want to offer me the job the day that I'm there. And if you're not doing all of those things, I guarantee you you're losing candidates. Because if you can't get them in and get them into the company within two weeks, they're going someplace else. And so you've got to understand that they're still looking while they're applying to you. They're still looking when they're interviewing with you. They're still looking when you hire them. And they're still looking while they're working for you. And you can say, oh, disloyal, that's horrible. It's not. It's their life. And if you want to say those darn kids, I'll say those darn parents. Because we created it. And they've been in charge since they were about two years old. And they know it, and they know they're winning the, the battle here, and they're going to use it. And we can be mad about it, but the reality is, is that's what's happening. And then once we get them, what are we doing to make them feel like they are a part of the organization? How do we onboard them? How do we bring them in and make them feel like the family? Because if they don't feel like they're part of the family, they're going to go someplace else. What's that first day look like? What does the first week look like? What does the first month look like? And then how do you keep them engaged? Because I guarantee you, at the end of the day, they're going home to somebody, and they're going to say, how was your first day at work? And the answer to that question is going to tell you whether or not they're coming back for the second day of work. And so you can, again, we can say, oh, that's not right, that's not loyal, they don't care, they're not with us. It's got nothing to do with that. They've got options, and they know they've got options. And so they're going to utilize everything that they've got. Once we get them, now more than ever, companies are starting to look at their benefits and saying, is this an advantage for us? We've always offered 401k. We've always offered pay. We've always offered health care. But depending on where you are in your life, different things matter to you. So are we being responsive to the people that we are trying to hire? If I'm looking for younger people, I guarantee you a student loan match means a lot more to them than a 401k match. One is 50 years away, one is destroying my life today as I know it. So if that's who we're looking for, then we have to, have to offer benefits that that's who they want. And what the benefits are becoming now is the differentiation for the people that we're looking for in terms of a work-life balance. What do they want? I have three kids in their heyday. I think they named an ER after us. I would have wanted health care. They got their own health care now. It's not as big of a deal to me anymore. I don't need student loan paybacks. 401k, vacation, that all means something to me. So now companies are trying to figure out how do we take what we've got and provide it in a way that this is a group of people that we can go after. Everyone wants flexibility. Everybody is looking to be a part of something. Everybody wants to believe in something. And so we have to tell our own story as employers now. Not hope that they figure out that we do good work, but explain to them that we do good work. So now you've got to go out and get them. As I said before, at 3% unemployment, you're looking in different places than you've ever looked before, and the whole market has shifted. 
So now we've got all of these people that are freelancing. About 51 million people have decided, I don't want to go work full time for somebody. So hint number one, if all of your jobs say full time, you're probably cutting out a whole bunch of people. Can we do it with two people? Can we do it with three people? Can we gig them in a way that they want to work? It'll probably save us money too because we won't be offering benefits. But as soon as you put all those qualifiers in there, our recruiting team will tell you that when you come in and you give us the 14 things you want from somebody, we're going to tell you the odds of you getting all 14 are about zero. So tell me what you really have to have, and we can build the rest of it once they're here. So we've got to look at things like that. For those that are especially in manufacturing, you know, one of the things that we have in Wisconsin is a corrections department and a technical college system that works really well with people who have been incarcerated and prepares them when they want to come out. This has now become a supply chain issue for a lot of companies that they're saying, yeah, I'll take those folks. They learned how to weld. They learned how to run a CNC machine. If you want someone and you want to intervene in somebody's life and you truly want to help them, you're not going to get anybody more loyal than this than if you can turn somebody's life around by offering them a really good job. The niche populations. Companies are now having to look at this and say, okay, what are the obstacles? Childcare, transportation, those are probably the two biggest ones. And so we're saying, all right, we need 10 people in the front of our office right now. We can't get anybody to apply for those jobs. They're all saying childcare. All right, we're going to hire 20 people. We're going to have them all work half time, and we're going to match them up with another person so they can swap childcare back and forth. No childcare costs, and I get a part time job. That's what an employer has to do in order to get those 10 people. We're losing our folks at our manufacturing facility in northern Wisconsin. How do we differentiate ourselves? Well, they're all snowmobilers, they're all fishermen, they're all hunters, they all want to be outside. So if we go from five eight-hour days to three 12-hour days with a weekend, we just gave them a four-day weekend. I'll bet you they're not going to leave now, and they don't. So companies are now having to say, how do we fit lifestyles? Deloitte went after women whose children had gone back to school because they knew that they now had from nine to three. They didn't want 80 hours a week, but they wanted to get back to work. So they gave them some flexibility, and they were able to hire people that, had it said full-time job, they would have never come back again. So that's what companies are doing now in terms of trying to go out and find people. Diversity of everything. If you're interviewing 25-year-olds, they're probably coming in and they're asking a bunch of questions around, what's my career path? What does the system look like? What's the training I'm going to get? Do you have a DEI council? What's your diversity policy? Those are the things that they're asking now. So we better make sure that we've got answers to all of those things. And when they're looking at your jobs online, they better see that diversity. Because that's something that's incredibly important to them, and it's something that they want to make sure that they've got. Disabilities is another one. A lot of you have probably hired people with disabilities. I would argue previously it was probably more for altruistic reasons than for getting work done reasons. Now it's for getting work done reasons. You know, and when you have someone who's running the organization that says there's a bit of a craze for hiring people with autism. People with disabilities have incredible abilities. And so now companies are trying to figure out how do we put those to work for us. For younger kids, it's always JOMO, or I mean, it's always FOMO, it's the fear of missing out. I've reached the age of JOMO, which is the joy of missing out. I don't want to go to budget meetings. I don't want to supervise people. I don't want to have to do performance reviews. I want to do stuff like this. I enjoy doing stuff like this. So we have all of these people now that are hitting ages and they want to do something a little bit different. What are we doing with those folks? How do we hang on to them? And you're going to get a lot more of it in just a couple of minutes. One of the things with the, with the pipeline is you have to be the first person to get your hands on somebody and then hold on tight. And so apprenticeships, youth apprenticeships, um, co-ops, internships, all of those things have become more valuable for employers because if you're the first one to get them, you're likely to hang on to them. At least you've got a chance. I don't expect the immigration issue to be solved in my lifetime, um, but there are other ways around that as well. People have now started going to U.S. territories. So places like Puerto Rico and the Philippines and saying, all right, if we can begin to bring people back, if we can bring back 10, and they bring back their family, and they bring back their extended family. Pretty soon I got a group of people that are coming. 
So if you're an HR person and you're looking to take a vacation that's paid for by your company, tell them you're going to go recruit and pick something south. There's opportunities there, and that's where people are now going. And as I say, if that doesn't look like Racine in February, I don't know what does. What do you do in terms of making contact with people? I've coached high school sports since I was 18 years old. I've hired six people that played for me as a 16-year-old. Why did I hire them? Work ethic, character, ability to get along with others, leadership, all the stuff that I'm looking for. And so I can go back and say, all right, who was that? Who were those people? And go get them. We all coach. We all work at schools. We all volunteer in organizations. All of those are opportunities for you to find people. And anybody who's driven the soccer van or the football van or the basketball van, it's amazing to me what people will say right behind you like you can't hear it. And you know within a six-mile trip which kids you want your kid hanging out with and which ones you don't. Which are the ones that you want them hanging out with. And then it's an Uber world. And so people are using Uber now for a whole bunch of things. They're using Uber to get their people to work. They're using Uber as a last resort if somebody's car breaks down because transportation's a problem, call Uber, we've got an account. They're using Uber-style hiring to say, when do you want to work, how many hours do you want to work, and we will plug you in, nursing and warehousing especially. I'll take six hours over none. I'll take 20 if I can't get 40. They'll take whatever they can get in order to get there. So those are a few of the things that people are doing. So I would say to you, right now, if you're looking for things to do, almost everything I just said, you could probably start tomorrow, and you could start having at it and going to find people and understanding what they're looking for. And long term, I would say the nice thing about this problem is we know exactly where our supply chain is. It's sitting in a middle school, a high school, a tech college, a university. We know where those people are. It's our responsibility to go in there, to find them, to get them, to get them loyal to us, and to hang on to them. And so companies are doing all of these types of things. And at the end of the day, we have now reached this work-life balance thing where there isn't work time and lifetime. Everything's all mushed together now. And so what are people looking for? What are the hours they need? Do they have kids? What are their outside responsibilities? And if we can fit what they're looking for, then we become their employer of choice. And so companies have to step back a little bit and say, who do we need? How many do we need? And then who is it that's going to fit those roles? So that's just a little bit on where we're at right now, what's sort of causing all of this. I said, now, I was just telling you about the problem. Now you can get all the solutions.